With close to 100 buses, inmates are picked up from the various courts and police stations in the county of Los Angeles. Their first stop inside L.A. County Jail is the inmate reception center. On the busy days, uh, on Monday through Tuesday, we're talking about anywhere from 600 to 800 inmates that are being booked each of those days. On Wednesday, Thursdays, and Fridays, the numbers are somewhat less. But we average uh, about 400 a day if you take out the whole seven-day work period. It's 7 p.m. on a Monday night, and the IRC's garage is filling up like New York City's Port Authority. For two hours, buses fortified like prison cells drop off hundreds of inmates to be booked into the county jail. Well, first thing what we do is back here behind us, we have the search out rooms. Um, the inmates are brought in from different courts um, and from different station holding tanks, and they're sat there, and then we process them, we line them up, um, remove all their contraband that they have. We also uh, remove any um, knives or guns, whatever they might come in with uh, from the streets. Sometimes they put drugs inside their shoes, uh, extra uh, handcuff keys inside their shoes as well. Following the search, identification wristbands with booking numbers and barcodes are scanned into the jail's central computer. The inmates are then given bologna sandwiches and some juice. From there, they are told to follow a series of lines painted on the floor. OK, blue line's going to take them to cell B, which is for males. Um, and they're going to wait They're going to wait in that cell to be booked. Yellow line's going to take them into cell 1, which is going to be in classification. If they've already been booked, then they can go on and go ahead and be classified. Um, inmates are classified into three levels, uh, low, medium, and high, depending on their past crimes. Yeah, it's my second time. It's for the same thing. I didn't uh, finish my uh, domestic violence classes. And that's why I got sentenced for uh, 180 days for not completing them. 21-year-old convicted wife batterer Miguel Castillo is no stranger to the system. The worst thing of processing that you don't get your bed until may, sometimes eight hours, 10 hours. Today, they told me I was going to get a bed until 24 hours. It's a long drive from Santa Monica to LA. And we had a stop off in Beverly Hills, and it was sunny. 28-year-old multiple drug offender Daniel Johns has only been in jail for a few hours, but he's already missing his freedom. I, I wished I was outside, and, you know. I've I, I seen a lot of people um, at the liquor store, you know, and uh, maybe people at the, uh, at the beach, you know, when I was leaving Santa Monica. It's just places that I wanted to be. Before inmates can be housed, they need to be classified. Have any tattoos? No. Have you ever served in the military? No. Are you homeless? No. Are you taking any prescription medication that you would need within the next six hours? No. Are you thinking about killing yourself? No. Once an inmate has been classified, um, if he hasn't been fingerprinted or uh, photoed, his booking photo, they'll wait inside the cell behind you. They're called out one by one. We'll bring them out to the machines, the light scan machines behind us. Uh, we'll fingerprint them digitally. Uh, the fingerprints are actually sent down to Cal ID, which is in Norwalk, and they'll match that, that person's fingerprints up with past crimes that he's done. Can I agree, line, gentlemen? If you're shit done, you the night. Once the new inmates have been fully processed, they are stripped down, showered, and given their L.A. County blue. Before any inmate can leave the IRC, they need to be x-rayed for tuberculosis checked medically by a doctor, and screened by a psychiatrist. You want to hurt yourself. What plans do you have to hurt yourself? I don't know whatever plans I can come up with. Not put a rope in front of you, you're going to hang yourself? That's, that's very possible. That's very possible? It's very possible. Are there voices talking to you? Yes, there is. You hear voices telling you to hurt yourself? Yeah. With only a few minutes with each inmate, psychiatrists at the IRC have the hard task of diagnosing complex mental disorders before deciding where they are to be housed. It's 1 o'clock in the morning in the IRC, and for one inmate, the long wait has taken its toll. Everybody else sit down. Apparently, he was told to do something, and uh, he did not comply. At that point, uh, he became physically uncooperative, and we had to take him to the floor when he started to fight us. In cases where inmates are determined to be a danger to themselves, psychiatrists or mental health doctors may order the deputies to place the inmate in four-point restraints. Mental health staff has ordered you to be placed in four-point restraints. You understand that? 
For both deputies and inmates' protection, all four points are videotaped. On a busy 8-hour p.m. shift, staff can be asked to administer as many as six four points a day. Not by the camera. Really, the majority of them are pretty, uh, pretty much, well, about half of them are cooperative. Some come up here really angry, really upset, some just, you know, not in touch with reality. Sometimes we get people up here that come up here because they spit on the deputies. Uh, they wear spit masks. Or sometimes they try to bite the deputies. So we ask the deputies to be very, very careful. Obviously, we don't want to hurt the inmate. We try to put them in positions that are not uh, where they won't hurt themselves or where my deputies will not get hurt. So there's a variety of things that can happen. This depends on the inmate himself, how he behaves from here on out. Next, lockup takes you inside Men's Central Jail, L.A. County's most notorious maximum security facility. After 15 hours in L.A. County's inmate reception center, these prisoners are sent to Men's Central Jail. Built in 1963, this maximum security facility can house up to 7,500 inmates. Larger than most state prisons, the 900,000 square foot facility is the first stop for 90% of the inmates. What you've got here is an entire population of the downtrodden. You've got, you've got the, the losers in society, you've got uh, gang members. Here we have everything from DUIs, uh, they're in here for a day or two, to 187's uh, Mexican Mafia uh, affiliates that are here for, for cases that end up going upstate pretty soon. We've had Robert Downey Jr., uh, all the big celebrities. Straight out of the academy, sheriff's deputies are assigned to a jail before getting a street patrol. They can spend, on average, three to four years working the jails. With the help of custody assistance, deputies are there to keep the peace and to get the inmates to court on time. General population for men's central jail is located on the second floor. The low to medium security inmates are put in day rooms that can hold up to 30 people. The maximum security inmates share a 10 by 10 cell with up to six other men. It's like we go nowhere. Uh, we do everything in our cell. Uh, clothing exchange once a week. We shower every other day, you know, but we never come out of the cell. We get fed three times a day, you know. It's like the same gig every day, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't change. It's pretty rough, you know. Just you miss your family a lot, loved ones. Just... You just got to blanket, blanket out most of the time, you know? Just take it day by day. That's all you could do. That's all you could do. Twice convicted robber, 21-year-old Gabriel Anthony Bernal, will be doing 12 years in state prison before he sees freedom again. Due to the California Three Strikes Law, if convicted again, he will spend the rest of his life in jail. I got to walk, walk that straight line. You know, I have two strikes now. I'm a two-striker. Just been convicted of my second strike facing some serious time, you know? I gotta get my head right. So I'm, I plan to be a little construction worker. You know, it's too late for school, mostly. For other inmates, like 19-year-old Matthew Kropp, who was arrested for robbery, being locked up is part of being a gangster. Yeah, you know, I don't plan on, nobody plans on coming to jail. I don't think they do, I don't. It just happens, you know? Living in a gangster's life, you know? With only one hour per week outside the cell, inmates find creative ways to occupy their time spent in jail. It starts down here with a man and woman conceiving a child, a Latin, male, Hispanic. The teardrop on, on his, his cheek, there's a tattoo for, for murder, and he's doing life. Eight 
18-year-old Tishon Solomon is waiting to be sent to state prison for 12 years on a felony drug conviction. I mean, it, to tell you the truth, it's like the street. You know what I'm saying? You meet people, live your life, eat, do I mean, you know, do about the same as you do on the street. So, you know, me, I done been here for like 10, 11 months. It's nothing to a boss, you know? Many of the state prison inmates in California come from the L.A. County Jail. With an annual budget in the hundreds of millions, overcrowding continues to be a growing concern. As you can see, I've got, you know, concrete and bars. You know, I don't have any place to expand. I can't make another cell. That's, that's the Achilles heel of jail systems everywhere, is how many inmates you have. That's your clients. The Los Angeles County Jail has a higher inmate to guard ratio than any other county jail in the country. Sheriff's deputies have to deal with the daily threat of getting stabbed, having feces thrown at them, and even contracting AIDS. For some deputies, the stress is too much to handle. We've had guys come in just today, day or two, and they look around and they're like, I'm out of here. They'll give us the keys and they won't even say that they're really even out of here. Well, next day we'll come in and they'll be gone. And I'll go down and check it out and they'll be like, yeah, well, he resigned or, you know, because this is where you actually figure out if you really want to do this or not. Five minutes, get ready. With their hands in their pockets and heads pointed to the ground, lines and lines of inmates are ushered through the long corridors of the jail to and from court. When they return to their housing units, each inmate is searched and taken through a series of metal detectors. Well, uh, it's, it's an adventure every day. Deputy Shannon Sidney works on the fifth floor of the jail, also called 5,000. It houses homosexuals. These inmates are segregated for their own protection. I call it the drama floor because you, you get a mix of everything. Normally, um, they're separated from everyone else simply because you can't put them in general population because a lot of times they will be, they will be abused. You can get uh, rape or sodomy incidents. They wear blue tops and yellow pants. And with males, they, uh, they have black shoes because there's a lot of homosexual inmates that they, they can fool you. They, uh, they gender biased or gender bending, and it's, uh, it's hard to tell. I mean, it's not pleasant, but it all depends on how you look at things, you know what I mean? I just, you know, try to make the best of my situation, regardless of where I'm at. For the last 25 years, 37-year-old inmate Bernard Swain has been in and out of jail for drugs and prostitution. You know, it just goes with everything. You know, you're out there making fast money, doing the streets, doing drugs and stuff like that. When you come in here, you know, you just got to take the bitter with the sweet. It kind of balances out. Due to the widespread of sexually transmitted diseases like HIV and hepatitis, officials at Men's Central Jail are considering supplying inmates with condoms. Um, yeah. Especially in the gay dorms, it's not safe. We don't have no protection in here, no safe sex. You know, there's a lot of people in here with HIV, you know, and stuff like that, and they just pass it on to other people. And it's, it's not clean whatsoever, you know, for, for sexual stuff, yeah. Sometimes the visitors that come to see the inmates will flash for the inmates. For most inmates, getting visits from family members and friends is the only link to the outside world. For 18-year-old convicted murderer Antonio Bobo, this is the first family visit he's had since being jailed. What do you talk to your cousin about usually when she comes to visit? After what's going on in the streets, you know, how's her life going? How's the family going? Basic conversation. General population gets 15 minutes, four days a week. That's it. They're on the timers. We push the button, they start up, and it clicks when they go off. But as soon as the phone shut off, the voices tend to get a little loud. Guys start to wander from row to row, and we got to keep an eye on that. And we don't want them passing things from other inmates. They can go upstairs, such as any type of contraband, uh, drugs, any uh, shanks or anything of that nature. More than half of the inmates in L.A. County Jail don't get visitors. Next on Lockup, one of the most dangerous assignments in L.A. County Jail, gang intelligence. Today in the L.A. County Jail, almost half of the 20,000 inmates are street gang members. 
as seen in this footage, out of the 1,500 assaults that occur in the jail per year, 70 to 80 percent of those crimes are committed by a rival gang member. Uh, I saw with a deadly weapon, a stabbing, uh, knocking a guy down and just kicking him till he's bleeding, uh, those type of crimes. Gangs in L.A. County Jail are highly organized groups with deadly rules and regulations. The gang leaders, or shot callers, earned their titles by committing murders to gain the respect from both their enemies as well as fellow gang members. Inmates targeted for a gang hit are called green lighters. These are individual names. I mean, it's real difficult to read. This, they write very small so that it makes it difficult for us to try to decipher it. But uh, the top part, these are gangs that just uh, are to be assaulted. And then uh, they have what they call hard candy, and those are individuals that they want killed. To combat the growing problem of gang violence behind bars, a task force called Operation Safe Jail, or OSJ, was formed. We try to identify who the gang members are that are in the system, and then we kind of try to make a guess at what level in the gang they are. If there's somebody who's very active, we'll try to isolate them from general population. Sergeant Roger Ross is in charge of the OSJ unit that monitors all gang activity within the L.A. County jail system. Los Angeles County Jail is unique in the fact that every gang in Los Angeles County ends up coming here. It doesn't matter if they're a black gang, an Asian gang, a Hispanic gang, or a white gang. If they're active in Los Angeles County and they get arrested, they end up coming to the Los Angeles County jail system. The OSJ unit must rely on communication to help prevent gang violence. Solving crime is all about getting the information from somebody. It's not physical evidence. Who are you guys warring with right now? Man, we ain't really warring with nobody. We just, it's just a money thing right there now. Oh, you got we all, mainly, everybody, mainly we just, you know, we doing our thing. You know, everybody doing their individual thing, so. You guys have had a history of feuding with who? Uh, blacks or Hispanics? throughout the years over there? It's been a history of whoever, whoever stepped on our toes. Knowing which gangs are fighting each other helps the OSJ unit decide who to remove from general population and where to search for weapons. We have found them with hacksaw blades, anything that uh, a metal, metal rod in our ovens. You have the grills that you put in the oven to, to cook on. They'll break off the rods on that. Here's a shampoo bottle that was just once a plastic bottle. They've melted down and uh, converted that into a weapon. Getting caught with a jailhouse weapon is a serious offense, which is why gang members take extreme measures to hide them. We have here is uh, the first one looks like a wire shank. Basically, they've recovered that off a vent. These two are both shoe shanks. There's a metal support in different types of shoes, basically all shoes. They take them out and file them to a point also to one end and use them as a either stabbing device um, or what have you. Unfortunately for the inmates, the OSJ unit can't prevent all acts of violence inside the jail. Sometimes they get there too late. And we've had similar situations where we found the inmate after the whole thing was open over and he was dead. Uh, here's a photo of an individual that wasn't so fortunate as to be uh, saved in time. For inmates who do commit murders and assaults, there is the high power floor. High power is a section for high security inmates only. It's a jail within a jail. Deputies assigned to this floor are hand-picked due to their expertise in dealing with the worst inmates. Everybody in this section is classified as a K-10 which is no inmate contact with other inmates. All their movement is done, their waist chained, their exercise is all isolated, very limited uh, contact with other inmates due to their highly assaultive behavior. Sheriff Deputy Dan Shannon has supervised high power for the last three years. We had several, several stabbies and you know, you can't let your guard down for a second because that's when neither you will be assaulted or they will assault somebody else. High power inmates are housed in single six by nine cells and are monitored by surveillance cameras and deputies 24 hours a day. Basically, this is what we call a catwalk. It's a security corridor for staff to go down a row and visually either 
do a security check, their account, or just get down the row and, and see what's going on. The walls are all, all painted black and so, so that they don't see us. Th this is a one-way mirror, and so they, they can't see us, but we can see them. In case of a riot, catwalks can also be locked down to protect deputies from violence. Are you mentally insane, dude? Next, lockup takes you inside tower number one, where the biggest challenge is protecting inmates from themselves. While drugs, violence, and gangs are a common problem in jails across California, a variety of mental health issues in the inmate population also create a considerable challenge for overworked jail administrators. With large numbers of these inmates returning to the community every day, mental health professionals and sheriff's deputies are working together to find better ways to identify and treat their patients before they head home. Tower number one is a 185 foot tall facility that has no bars. The thousands of square feet of security glass and other acoustical materials serve as sound barriers, making it a uniquely quiet facility. Its high-tech design allows a module control deputy to see into each of the 96 cells with one glance. This is where all of the male inmates with mental health problems are housed. Every morning in tower number one, doctors, nurses, and deputies meet to discuss inmates' treatments and behavior. To protect the inmates' identities from MSNBC's cameras, the staff refers to their booking numbers. Inmate 227 I saw yesterday on the seventh floor. He's doing a lot better, so um, I thought we'd give him a try down here. He's still very paranoid, so we may want to kind of approach him a little cautiously. Um, any problem, people? We have five that are on lockdown. We have inmate 015 for creating disturbance. He has 24 hours lockdown. That's all I have. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Jeffrey Marsh is the co-team leader for the mental health program in Tower Number 1. Well, we try to get everyone's perspective on what's going on. We also try to get a feel for who's here, who's new, um, who's left, what we've done. Uh, during the course of their stay. Dr. Thomas Klotz is the chief psychiatrist for the L.A. County Jail, which provides mental health services to the 160,000 inmates that come and leave jail every year. I did a high-speed pursuit because I was just sick of being harassed by law enforcement, which is the biggest mistake I ever made in my life. For inmate Timothy Matisse, who was sentenced two years for possession of methamphetamine, the Department of Mental Health's programs has helped him discover the problems that led him to jail. So the high-speed pursuit was related to these oh, fears that you had? Um, well, yeah, the, the way they make it look like is they're going to say, OK, well, maybe he's schizophrenic. If, uh, and if it's already known that I'm not schizophrenic and it's really happening, it's going on, then they're going to say, well, it's the drug use. For other inmates at L.A. County, Death is the easiest way to escape their cells. We put a tremendous amount of effort into developing this screening system because we know that the highest risk, particularly for suicide, of people entering custody is during the first 24 hours that they're incarcerated. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, suicide ranks second behind natural causes as the leading cause of death behind bars in local jails. Yeah, but it's a strong urine smell. Um, do our best to keep that smell away, but that's pretty typical of a jail, especially a mental housing unit. Senior Deputy Paxton Reinecker supervises the suicide floor, which houses the most severe mentally ill inmates. Each person, when they're new to the seventh floor, are, are given the suicidal gown. And what that does is it's nearly impossible to tear that gown apart to hang themselves clog the toilets, the stuff that they do on a daily basis, a lot of these guys. Inmates who are suicidal are put in single cells and are checked on every 15 minutes by a deputy. Tell me again, one more time, nice and slow. You know, I, I, I eat my hands because the two, two officers... You, you eat yourself? Yes, because two officers just lie to me. 
They just lied to you? Yes, I do. What'd they lie to you about? I'm the chief of the FBI. So I'll get there because who was promoting me, I think, in 19... On March the 6th, 1948, yeah, they're gonna hoop up, sign a, a bill, make, make, make me deputy chief of the FBI. Also on March the 6th, yeah, they're gonna hoop up, sign a bill that made me chief of the FBI. This inmate, who due to his mental condition cannot be identified, has not left his cell for seven months. A lot of the writing on the door is uh, human feces, and he also has combined a little mustard on it uh, for coloring. So that's what he's writing with on the actual door. A lot of the stuff inside, he's able to get a lead tip or whatever. He's been here for a long time, so he just continually works on it. Next, lockup takes you inside tower number two where female felons, prostitutes, and drug abusers are housed. Across the nation, the number of women behind bars has continued to grow at a rapid pace. According to the U.S. Department of Justice, women account for 17% of all felony convictions in state courts and 11% of all violent offenses committed. Tower number two of the L.A. County Jail houses all of the women inmates. Like tower number one, its modular design with no bars and high visibility makes it easier for deputies to manage the inmates. A lot easier because you don't have the movement going on that you did like at the old jails. You had a lot of movement. Everybody had to go down and eat chow in the chow hall. And now um, they all eat in their pots. <laughs> So we just, we don't have the movement. And you also have uh, direct uh, supervision where everybody has moved with a deputy or a custody assistant or officer. 16-year veteran Nancy Medina is the line sergeant for Tower 2. How you doing, ladies? She's responsible for all the deputies and custody assistants on the evening shift. I start out with check-in. We check in all our employees for the shift, uh, specifically PMs. And then I go from floor to floor and check and make sure they're doing their jobs, the count is clear. Hi. How come you're all in there? Huh? You having a party in there? We have a certain number of inmates that are in the facility, and what we do is we have to actually count the heads to make sure that every body is where it's supposed to be. If it's not, then we have to find out where the body is. Two and seven. Yeah. 44? More than half of the women inside L.A. County Jail are in for drug-related charges. I got four years state prison, uh, e in, even though, and in spite of the, um, the newly adapted Proposition 36, where we're, we're supposed to be able to go to drug programs. If we have a drug problem, then I do have one. 50-year-old habitual drug offender Kimberly Jean Maybe has a difficult time being treated like an inmate. We are threatened for everything. We're threatened to sit, in life, to sit for count. We are threatened to get on our bunks. We are threatened uh, to get things out of our hair that um, may just make us feel a little bit more feminine. But every year that I come to a county jail, I am defeminized more. 46-year-old inmate and mother of three children, Denise Branna, committed her first robbery at the age of 40. Number six is where I live. This is temporary residency, right? OK. Come on in. You are entering my little domain. Here's my plastic mirror. I put my makeup on every day. I wash my face right here. I flush my toilet. Me and my roommate, we share this. Known to the other female inmates as mom, Branna sees this time in jail as a wake-up call. I, feel I, I got a, a degree in child development. I work with kids. I just make the wrong choices. Maybe it's the rush of thinking, can I get away? If I do it, can I get away with it? But I had, you know, get caught every time, you know? But this is the wake-up call. This is it. This is all. I feel if I have to go through something like this again, we'll hold trial and jury on the street, and I'll die before I come back. That's it. 
Female inmates who commit jailhouse violations are brought before a review board called Sergeant's Court. We have them come down here to the hole, and then we have a hearing for them, and we decide how many days they're going to get in the hole. Okay, you're here. Um, you were charged with fighting and creating a disturbance. Uh -huh. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I do. So somehow she got a bloody lip. You think she bit it? Yes, yeah, she. <laughs> I think she did herself. Seriously, because she she did lie about me having a pick mm -hmm. in my hand, trying to stab her. So did you hit her back? Yes, I hit her back. Okay. Depending on the violation, an inmate can receive up to 20 days in the hole. Well, I'm going to give you eight days. All right, next time you have any kind of problems, you get a hold of the deputies. I have a problem with eight days. OK. Do you want to, uh, you want to appeal it? I don't know how she got that injury, but uh, I gave her the same amount of days I'm going to give you, which is eight days down here. So hopefully that will keep you from fighting again. You won't want to come back here. She's ready to go back. Once a female inmate has been sentenced by the sergeant, they are stripped of their phone, visiting, and exercise privileges and placed on lockdown. This is the discipline module, module 211. It's considered by the inmates, you know, the whole. This button here, this is for emergencies. Custody assistant Carolina Salazar works the discipline module that can house up to 47 female inmates. They're making noise. What's your medical emergency, Gilbreth? Okay, I'll send the trustee over to get you some, okay? I like it. Solitude, you know, giving me time to think. I ain't got to worry about nobody, you know, being too close or, you know, bothering me. Just me and my own thoughts. With only five days left in her 20 days of isolation in the hole for fighting, 37-year-old inmate Kene Haynes discovered ways of breaking up the monotony. Well, you could talk, you could talk through the vents. It's like right here in, your, in the, the sink part right here. Right here, there's holes, and you can communicate with your neighbor. But I used to communicate with my neighbor, but she left today. Were you happy for her? No. I wanted her to stay, because <laughs> she used to sing to me every night. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I wanted her to stay. That's selfish, but I'm a selfish one. 30% of the women incarcerated in L.A. County Jail have a significant risk of mental health problems. According to a study conducted by the Jail's Department of Mental Health, it was also found that the majority of these women are drug abusers. So the bottom line, I think, is that we're dealing with a very difficult population. Dr. Michael Maloney is the head of the Women's Mental Health Treatment. And we're dealing with a group of people who really don't get uh, mental health services that are effective in the community. So many of them drift down to the point that they get arrested. With 300 to 450 women receiving mental health treatment in the jail every day, officials must rely on group therapy programs to help the inmates learn how to deal with their problems when they leave jail. Explain that to me. To stay off drugs if you're young, and you're basically trying to be somebody in life, leave those drugs alone because if you're on drugs, you can't cope. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like all of you guys here are really seeing the impact of how drugs has influenced where we you are today. Drugs as a coping me mechanism because we have no coping yes. skills. So so coping skills. Yeah. Yeah. Very exactly. good. That's why I'm here to start over. I turn myself in so I can end it all. I'm ready to quit get away from it all, gets old. Inmate Dina Marie Benz says jail provided the opportunity to come clean of the 15 years of drug addiction that threatened her and her three children. My 17-year-old, she understands. She gets mad at me, you know. My five-year-old, he just wants to be with me, but that's why I'm here. I talked to him yesterday, and he just says, I go, you know where mommy is? And he says, yeah, in jail. And that's the first time I've talked to him in months. So, but he knows when I get out that I'll be there to see him and get him. But I can't do that until I get out. But it was a good thing. Excuse me. Inmate Benz will be doing 100 more days in county jail before she can be with her family again. Next, lockup takes you to L.A. County Jail's Camp Hugathug.
In the 2000 elections, California voters passed Proposition 36, endorsing treatment for nonviolent drug offenders. According to the Bureau of Justice Statistics, criminal activity usually drops more than half after offenders receive substance abuse treatment. The L.A. County Jail's answer to this growing trend in reducing recidivism is the Viscaloos Recovery Center. And here they get a very intense, very emotional, very personal contact, and, and we stress accountability on everything they do here. Often referred to as Camp Hug-a-Thug, the recovery center encompasses a drug abuse program and a batterer program for men convicted of a domestic violent crime. It's generally set up for someone uh, to a low to a medium security inmate. We look for someone who's feeling uh, that they want to show a commitment to a program. They want to see it through. Upon entry to the recovery center, inmates are greeted by an elaborate koi fish pond and waterfall with housing units equipped with clean carpets, air conditioning, and lots of windows for sunshine. The only physical remnants of jail is the perimeter fence and razor wire. To just be a happier person, I have a lot of hope today. I never had hope before, and now and I know sooner, as soon as I'm done with this program, I'll be one happy person. 24-year-old inmate and drug addict Anthony Trujillo has been in the impact drug treatment program for 90 days. I was skeptical at first. I mean, I came in with the attitude of, of you know, asking everybody, does this work? Is this really going to work for me? Because that's all I wanted to do is just, just let me know if this is going to work, what I got to do to work it, and then I'll be okay. You have a talker, that means you have to have a listener. listener. So you have to have communication with an open mind. Agree? Agree. So let me ask you this. What prevents communication in an open mind? Three-letter word. Ego. Oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> Ego. Ego. Everything's going OK. <laughs> so how can we prevent this unity? Communication and open-mindedness. Getting addicted to drugs is like crossing a highway. You know what I mean? It started out two lanes when you got using drugs, but now it's like 20 lanes, and you don't know how to get back across. For 44-year-old inmate David Hines, the IMPACT program is helping him deal with his 20 years of drug addiction. I thought I was the baddest man in the world, but everybody has fears, and they let you walk through them, come back around and introduce yourself to them, and then keep on going with your life. Uh, it's, the, 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 the counselors, I'm going to tell you, they work with us like you wouldn't believe. They really do. Can I ask you a question, Wayne? Yes. What are you going to get by being right? <laughs> to me, I would say a feeling of satisfaction. And why did you do drugs? To feel good. <laughs> <laughs> feeling of satisfaction. Feeling of satisfaction, feeling good. Yeah. Let me ask you this. Do the ends justify the means? No. You answered your own question. Okay. 75% of the inmates enrolled at the recovery center are not rearrested for the same crime, according to a recent survey conducted by county officials. Upon an inmate's completion of either the substance abuse or batteries program, they're given a graduation ceremony and a certificate. In order to break the cycle of violence is extremely difficult because you have to get honest with yourself. And that process will take you through a lot of valleys, places within you that you've never seen before. And I want to congratulate you gentlemen again on taking that journey. Former drug addict and wife batterer James Beard is the head counselor for the program. What we do is basically say, you put yourself in this chair. You can't blame anybody. You can't blame the judge. You can't blame your wife, your mother, your father. Ernest Lazelle Jewett. I'm not a um, very violent person, but I, I can be violent when I want to. Like other inmates in the program, 28-year-old Ernest Jewett has accepted his four-month sentence in jail and says he's determined to do things differently when he gets out. The bad thing about being in jail is that you can't see your family. You can see your family, but you can't hold your family. Um, you can't leave whenever you want to, but that's just a, a consequence of me doing what I've done. And if, if that's
that's uh, what it takes for me to get this in my head. Like I said, I have a thick head, so if uh, that's what it takes to get it through my head, shall be it. Anthony Ross. Thirty-six-year-old inmate Anthony Ross says graduating from the program has given him a new lease on life. I was going to keep on doing the same thing I was doing, you know, drinking, the whole nine yards. Since I've been here, I feel better, you know? You know, I, I'm at peace. You know, I, 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 this is Anthony. I, I, I made a promise to myself to complete the program, and I got it. I got it. I got it. I'm happy. I know my wife is going to be... She's just going to be overwhelmed. In the state of California alone, drug treatment programs like the one at L.A. County Jail are projected to save 100 to $150 million annually. Next, on this special two-hour edition of Lockup, we'll take you inside L.A. County's most dangerous Supermax facility, where the jail's largest riot happened. We'll also show you how sheriffs stop the violence with their new high-tech weapons, and we'll see how inmates process out having survived life inside L.A. County Jail. Due to mature and graphic subject matter, viewer discretion is advised. There are two million people behind bars in America. For the next hour, we open the gates. Lock up. New York tops the list, but Los Angeles is one of the safest major cities in America. Still, the Los Angeles County jail system is enormous. It's run by more than 13,000 employees and is the largest sheriff's department in the world. It houses more than 20,000 inmates in eight different facilities, all waiting for trials, transfers, or release. Let's go inside L.A. County Jail's Supermax facility that holds the city's most violent inmates. We'll show you how the jail detectives solve crimes committed behind bars and how violent inmates are learning to rehabilitate themselves. But first, we travel 40 miles north of downtown Los Angeles as we continue our look behind the walls of L.A. County Jail. Nestled in the high desert mountains and a 40-mile bus ride north of downtown Los Angeles is the Peter J. Pitches Detention Center. Named after a former sheriff, the Pitches Detention Center is comprised of four jails set on 2,500 acres. South Facility is an outdoor dormitory jail for low to medium security inmates. North Facility is a modern looking maximum security jail. East Facility, or Old Max, is the oldest jail in Los Angeles. And lastly, the crown jewel of the LA County Jail System is the North County Correctional Facility, or NCCF, which houses murderers, rapists, and drug offenders. Uh, we find that the linear style jail really doesn't work for us anymore. And what we have here is we have more of a, a podular design with the staff stations in the middle and then the inmates around the outside. A single facility comprised of five jails housing 3,800 inmates, NCCF, was designed in 1983. NCCF first made headlines in March of 1990 when the first President Bush helped dedicate the jail's opening. One of this nation's founding fathers said, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. Well, I'm sure that no one here would suggest that men were angels. And that's why there's government, to write the laws we live by and correctional facilities like this one for the people who break them. For 10 years, this facility had no major incidents. Then, on April 24, 2000, violence erupted. It was one o'clock in the afternoon when a racially based riot broke out between 50 to 60 black and Hispanic inmates. The surveillance video from this incident is still being withheld by prison officials for legal reasons. But the fighting within NCCF lasted for approximately 30 to 40 minutes in one of the largest riots that L.A. County Jail has ever seen. 
the fighting finally ended when the sheriff's emergency response teams were brought in. Using verbal commands, sting ball grenades, and pepper spray, sheriff deputies were able to prevent the inmates from killing each other. Except for one inmate whose injuries left him in a coma, most of the men involved in the riot suffered minor injuries. Uh, jail is completely different than what it was 30 years ago. For one thing, we have much more uh, violence-prone inmates in our system. Uh, in the past, that was never a problem. We did not have the major riots and the disturbances. 30-year veteran of the Sheriff's Department and commander of NCCF, John Vanderhork, blames the growing trend of violence in jail on the state prison gangs. Uh, we have inmates who are trying to establish their reputation uh, knowing that they are going to the state prison system. So they want to establish their reputation in the jail system as a major player. Because riots inside jail are a fact of life, deputies at L.A. County Jail are equipped with state-of-the-art, less-than-lethal weapons to assist them in stopping the violence. When I first came on the job 25 years ago, the only special weapon we had was a flashlight. That was it. Uh, if there was a riot, then the deputies had to go in with this, literally physical contact to uh, put it down. And over the years, uh, we've been uh, very much movers and shakers in terms of uh, trying new weaponry, less lethal weapons. Lieutenant Mike Pippin trains deputies every day in the use of less than lethal weaponry. Uh, this is a, uh, we call it a sting ball, say number 15 stinger. This is a sensory overload device in which uh, we will deploy uh, in a grenade fashion, pull the pin and throw the, uh, throw the grenade. Um, and in two seconds, this will ignite and explode. The shock wave will literally stun um, the individuals in the immediate area. In addition to that, it also deploys uh, uh, a number of small rubber balls that uh, will sting you. Manufactured in England, the Arwen gun shoots rubber projectile bullets and has been used by the Sheriff's Department for over 10 years. And I've used it quite a bit when I was a sergeant and working patrol where we would have uh, suspects, as an example, armed with a, uh, with a knife, where sometimes we were, you know, in the old days, we were faced with nothing, no other options but deadly force. Uh, utilizing the Arwen, uh, it's a very effective round. It'll take you right down to your knees. It's like a uh, 80 mile per hour hardball being delivered to uh, your chest or your, your diaphragm or your legs. Just recently added to the sheriff's arsenal of less than lethal weapons is the stun gun or taser. These uh, have just been issued to us uh, as of a couple of weeks ago in which they are uh, a new taser gun. It delivers a uh, very powerful jolt of electricity. The effect of the taser momentarily paralyzes potentially violent inmates long enough for deputies to control them, as seen in this surveillance video. As part of the training to use the new gun, all supervising officers had to be stunned with the taser. At a five second burst, and uh, I gotta tell you, this is, uh, I was bald skinhead at one time. Now I, I'm growing hair from all the electricity came through this. The Sheriff's Department relies heavily on their highly trained emergency response teams, or ERT, to stop the violence quickly. We have uh, inmate disturbances here on a routine basis, uh, so it's not uncommon for an emergency response team to be deployed uh, uh, once or twice a week. With new deputies coming from the academy and others heading out to patrol the streets, training for the emergency response team is constant. We train uh, several days a week probably on a routine basis, uh, all different shifts, all three shifts around the clock. I won't make any announcement to that fact that, uh, hey, we're going to have a drill tonight or something like that. I, I believe that you train the way you deploy and that the, uh, when, you know, I have an old saying is that when you, when you fail to train, you train to fail. As demonstrated in this drill, when a riot breaks out inside a dormitory or out on the exercise yard, the entire jail is put on lockdown status. David, lockdown, lockdown, lockdown. Three seconds. Are we on your racks? Let's go. Move it out. Once the jail is completely locked down, emergency response team deputies quickly suit up for battle. 40 seconds. 
Usually, uh, our, our response time for a, a, an ERT deployment would be, uh, uh, which consists of deputies responding to their location, they're getting all their gear on and responding to the, the disturbance location would be about two and a half to three minutes, probably. Even for the experienced ERT team members like Deputy David Godfrey, walking into a riot like this one that happened in the early 90s can be a frightening experience. Even on the smallest scenario, we're outnumbered probably four to one. We come out in a yard disturbance like outside like this, there could be two or three hundred inmates in the yard, uh, and you're, you're trying to put that down a riot with 10 to 12 deputies. So that's probably the scariest aspect of it, uh, just the sheer numbers. Okay, good job, guys. Excellent. Hit a lockdown in about a minute and 30 seconds. That's a record. After each training exercise, deputies are critiqued and evaluated on their performance during the drill. Do it like we train you. Bring it up, snap, bring it up and snap it. When you get out there and things get, get real tight and people are throwing things at you, you know, that's the last thing you think about. And you think about snapping it, don't. Because if it breaks on you, all you got is a big club. And that's not gonna do you guys or your team or anybody else any good. Next, lockup takes you inside 900 Max, NCCF's 24-hour lockdown jail. All inmates coming from downtown Los Angeles to North County Correctional Facility enter through the Inmate Processing Area, or IPA. Typically, we get anywhere from uh, three to four fish lines per day. Um, each fish line consists of approximately anywhere from 45 to 55 inmates. These are newly assigned inmates, first time here at NCCF. In the inmate processing area, the prisoners are searched again for any drugs and weapons. Basically, what, what they're doing is One, two, three. we have them squat and cough, One, two, three. and if they did secrete, if they did secrete anything in their, you know, rectal area by coughing, it helps bring it down to dislodge it. Once the inmates are searched, they are given new clothes and are assigned to a building depending on their security level. If they are high security, or also known as K-10 status, they are housed in 900 max. Everything. Drugs, murder, just everything. Everything. You name it, they're in here for it. All inmates in 900 max are housed in separate cells and can be locked down for up to 24 hours a day. When the inmates are moved, they are put in handcuffs and are escorted by at least two deputies. Deputy Sal Romero says dealing with the dangerous elite in 900 Max is all about respect. You respect them, they'll respect you back. Um, you kind of kind of earn the respect. You can't just go in there and try to, you know, force your will upon them. Because they're men, they're growing up, and there's some big boys here. So uh, you just got to respect them. They give you, you know, they'll give you respect if you show them respect, pretty much. Inmate Gabriel Perez is housed in 900 Max for his own protection. A day of life in uh, Max is like is um, a day of hell, basically, to anybody who's not used to it. He is a member of the notorious Matavia gang, said to be at war with the Mexican Mafia gang. You serve your first time, you learn your lesson, you get on and do good. And if you don't learn your lesson, you just get used to it. And after the tears go away, it just doesn't matter no more. It's just part of life for you. 28-year-old inmate Joseph Williams was just sentenced to 20 years for a double manslaughter. Just take it one day at a time. You know, um, I'm fortunate because some people, in my situation, they get life. Life without death, you know, the death penalty. Um, I'm fortunate to have a day to look forward to. It's going to be really hard for me because I have a three-year-old daughter, and from my calculations, she would graduate high school, and I won't be there to see her graduate high school. I'm fighting five counts of attempted murder of Los Angeles police SWAT. 44-year-old inmate Vangelis Dominic Garofalo first came to jail at the age of 17. After doing 10 years of hard time at Pelican Bay State Prison for manslaughter, he returned to L.A. County Jail. While awaiting trial for the very crime he claims to condemn, Garofalo offers his unique perspective on the new breed of street criminal. Jails are too full. But look at the new generation, carjacking. These kids will go out, 
stick a gun in someone's face to go joyriding in a car and turn a misdemeanor crime into a death penalty case. Because seven out of 10 times they carjack, they kill the person they steal the car from. Now you gotta tell me, there is not something wrong with that. And somewhere in that confusion, these kids don't know how to act like proper gangsters anymore. When my dad was a small time mafioso back east, he used to say there's two kinds of gangsters. There are thugs and there are gangsters. Thugs come and go. Gangsters are about making money and respect. And if you're gonna be a gangster in this life, there's two things you gotta know. You don't kill cops and you don't kill innocent women and children. 900 Max is also the home to NCCF's discipline module, otherwise known as the whole. Inmates land here for a variety of reasons. Anywhere from fighting to uh, cussing at a deputy or, or other personnel, um, not getting along in the dorm, if they may have problems in a dorm with somebody, um, they could be rolled up for what they call being a shot caller, um, hoarding uh, medication, uh, possession of a shank, which is a jail-made uh, weapon. Some inmates can spend up to 60 days in complete isolation. Every 30 minutes, we have to come down the rows, and we have to look inside each window uh, to make sure everybody's OK, because um, there is such a high rate of suicide in this area. Uh, we want to make sure that there's no fights, there's nobody uh, doing anything that they shouldn't be doing. Inmate Richard Hernandez is looking forward to getting out of the hole after not seeing the sun for 19 days. Yeah, it'll hurt my eyes for a little while. I'll see it, you know what I mean? They'll focus in. Probably play some handball in the yard. The inmates who are defending themselves in court are also located in 900 Max. I'm here in Los Angeles County, this particular facility, because I'm a pro per and I'm fighting my case, and I'm being held on to answer for a 422 PC, which is a alleged terrorist threat. Terrorist threat is that, you know, a statement made that, that, that is verbal, and um, from what I understand, it it must be received from the victim as, as a threat. With the odds against them, proper inmates Thomas Gleason and Ronnie Senegal still feel that they can represent themselves better than a public defender. So it's just simply being out there on the streets. The odds are against me. When, pe when police officers come through like slave catchers, you know, and, and literally give you cases that you have not committed, and they know you haven't committed it, but to, to gain the conviction and, and the actions from some of the courts are atrocious. Well, the representation that I had, I felt he was incompetent. You know, I'm facing 42 years of life, and I just took it into my own hands. I felt I could represent me better because I was at the incident. You know what I mean? Can't nobody represent me from just paper drawn up. And the representation that the people gave me was nothing. He just was coming in there doing his thing, and I felt like, nah, I didn't feel comfortable with him. These inmates could spend up to two years in 900 max waiting to present their defense in a court of law. Next, lockup takes you inside the jail investigations unit, where crime fighting happens behind the walls of L.A. County Jail. Located in a small bungalow at the Pitches Detention Center of L.A. County is the Jail Investigations Unit. Deputies assigned to this group try to solve the thousands of crimes that happen within the walls of the jail each year. We read police reports and we, we scrutinize the reports to make certain that all the elements of the crime are there and to see if, it's, uh, if there's sufficient evidence to prosecute someone for a violent crime. Assaults like this one on surveillance video break out daily in the jail. Sometimes these cases even escalate to murder. It's the detective's job to investigate the crimes and find witnesses to build a case for prosecution. Being tenacious and getting as much incriminating evidence as you can against the suspects, being able to remain cool when you have a very belligerent suspect or witness, and being able to put together a good case that's going to stick. Although rare but very dangerous for the inmate, 
Convincing witnesses to step forward is the quickest way the jail investigators can solve a crime like this inmate slashing case. It's actually the victim was sleeping on his bunk and he was suddenly attacked uh, by another inmate. And other inmates stepped forward and testified, were willing to testify against the, uh, the suspect. As a matter of fact, they testified in a preliminary hearing against that inmate, which was very, uh, very rare. Another method the detectives use in gathering criminal information is by talking to inmate informants, also known as snitches. You don't put yourself in a situation where the person that you're, that you're telling on can know that it's you. For his own protection, this inmate informant cannot be identified. Labeled in jail as a canine or a snitch, this inmate has been an informant both in jail and on the streets for 20 years. He recalls the arrest that started his career as a snitch. I had robbed somebody, and uh, it was in Hollywood. I was only like 18 years old. And I hid from the police up under a car, and I thought they were gone, and they wasn't. So the, the arresting officer told me, hey, look, we can work this out. You know what I'm saying? He said, you seem like you're a cool guy, and you just caught in a bad position. So he asked me to um, make some buys for him and we forget about this, and I did. And then ever since then, I've been had the label. Even though he's safely segregated from the general population, this snitch will always give up information when he feels his life is in jeopardy. You know, he could be not trying to just stick me, he could be trying to stick anybody in the dorm, and that keeps the dorm slammed down and we lose all our program. Deputies regularly search inmates' living quarters for drugs and weapons, using information from informants. Everybody stop where you're at, don't move. Two upstairs. Somebody turn off the TVs, please. Listen up, I'm gonna be dorm search, everybody's gonna go in the day room just as you are. Hurry up in the shower. Don't get up, don't put any shoes on. Just how you are, let's go, line it up. Before the dormitory can be searched, all the inmates are removed from the area and stripped down. All right, listen up, everybody. Strip it down, put all your property behind you. What I feel is by them checking your stuff, it should be something involved, like, uh, say, for an example, like uh, a certain inmate in some type of problem, a riot or something like that. 36-year-old inmate Kendrick Dwayne Wyatt, who's in county jail for burglary, feels the dorm search is unwarranted. Like, uh, sometimes that, that brings tension when there is no tension there. That brings tension to the inmates. And uh, I'm hoping there is no tension with be involved as this matter. For almost two hours, deputies armed with latex gloves search the inmates' bunks and belongings for razor blades, drugs, and other contraband. I have known recently that the, the welds on the bottom of the legs, those bust off sometimes when they lift them up and do things with them. So they'll stick things in there, drugs and uh, cigarettes, lighters, things like that that they can get in. They take the razors out of the razors we use for them. And they uh, wrap one end to protect themselves. So you'll take them out of here. They'll take apple juice and other juices, stockpile them. Uh, there's only one here, so that's not a big deal. But if they get a bunch of them, they'll use them to turn them into uh, a kind of a jail made uh, alcoholic beverage called Pruno. And they're not allowed to have. Articles like this. They'll use books. Uh, one time when I first got here, they used the back of a Bible to slip uh, uh, hacksaw blades in, and then they use those hacksaw blades to uh, affect an escape out of one of the buildings. This was folded up in what would appear to be a bookmarker, so that we would just go, oh, well, that's a bookmarker, leave it. If we weren't looking for things, we wouldn't find it. Like a game of chess, inmates try to outwit the deputies by finding new and different ways to break the rules. Yeah, right up here, Debbie Shakespeare found where the, uh, they pulled off the caps, off the lights, and uh, well, the, to, to expose the wiring, what they do is they uh, basically hot wire it and get a little spark and, and light stuff on fire. Um, they can either get, <clears throat> they uh, basically smuggle tobacco in here or drugs, they can light it off of that. Disciplinary action is given to the inmates that are caught with illegal items. What we'll do is, um, like these guys that have um, razor blades on their bunk, ask somebody, hey, yeah, it was mine. OK, then what we do is write um, um, an incident form out, and we send them down to our adjustment center down the 900 building. 
For 37-year-old inmate Perry Scranton, the dorm search is just part of being a prisoner. Well, actually, it, it don't feel too well because, you know, nobody likes people going to their, you know, their personal property, but it's something that has to be done. It's their job. You know, they got to make sure that everything is right. After the search, inmates return to their cells to clean up the mess. Next, lockup takes you inside Old Max, L.A. County's 50-year-old maximum security facility. And we'll see how two new inmates are dealing with their first week of being behind bars. Over the last decade, many states around the country have spent more money building jails and prisons than colleges. In the L.A. County jail system, the average stay for an inmate is 45 days, but some inmates can be locked up for more than two years. Finding room for those prisoners is a constant challenge. It requires not only the building of new jails, but also keeping the old ones running. East Facility is the oldest operating jail in Los Angeles. Otherwise known as Old Max, it was built in 1951 to handle overcrowding. The 15 dormitories inside the jail can house approximately 2,000 inmates. With the nation's jail population becoming more middle-aged, facilities like L.A. County's East Jail are trying to accommodate older inmates and keep them away from more violent younger ones. Well, this is the old man's dorm, uh, which is a privileged dorm. If you, um, you have to be 45 and older to be in this dorm. And if you mess up in this dorm, you go back to regular population. For almost 40 years, 51-year-old inmate Will Williamson has been committing crimes that land him in jail. Yeah, it's sickening. It's, <laughs> it's something, you know, you, you just have to put up with that. You know, I did it to myself again, you know. I said I wasn't coming back, and here I am. Same people, same everything. Just like I see people come in and out, there's people that come here and see me come and go. So it's just a headache all the way around. Will Williamson's outlook on being in jail is much different now than it was when he was first locked up at age 14. I'm more accepting now. There's before where I did something, it wasn't my fault. But I've learned to know and to realize that I did wrong because it's something that I wanted to do. And instead of coming in here blaming the officers for it, then I hold myself responsible for what I've done. Just down the road from East, is North facility. North was built in 1987 at a cost of $41 million and is a maximum security jail, primarily for younger inmates. From the outside, the jail looks like a military bunker with not a single window for inmates to see the outside. Well, I guess my lifestyle on the streets, you know, running with a gang and this, and stuff like that, you know, you get caught up on the streets, you know, you do a couple moves wrong, you end up in this place, you know. For 30-year-old inmate and active gang member Jeremy Blake, being in jail is much harder on his family than it is on him. My mother is uh, sick right now. She's on insulin, sugar diabetes, things like that, and uh, she's sick, and me being in here, you know, causing more stress, you know, doesn't help her any much either, so... That's why I want to stay hard, you know, it's not to come back here. I think it was, uh, let's see, three days ago. Where are we in today? What's today's date? I don't know. Already losing track of time in his first week in jail, convicted wife batterer Miguel Castillo has been transported from a small cell in downtown Men's Central Jail to a large dormitory with exercise yard at North Facility. This is where he will spend the rest of his 180-day sentence. Well, uh, I've been here, you know, since Wednesday. I've, you come out here for two hours. I think it's about two hours every day except Saturday and Sunday. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty cool, man, you know. You get to see the, the sun and the warm heat, you know. You don't get to see any green, but the only green you see is the deputy's you know, suit. They're a little stricter. You know, they're a lot stricter, but, you know, you got It's a lot better over here. Trying to survive and make the best of his situation, inmate Castillo searches for ways to cope with the problems that landed him in jail. 
I've already gave a few requests uh, for uh, parenting classes. That way I could see my son and my wife could come over, you know. I heard it's about two hours every visit. I'm able to play with my son at the, at the playground. So I'm looking forward for that. We last saw inmate Daniel John seven days ago when he first entered jail. In that short time, he's been housed in three different facilities. Now at North Facility, inmate Johns has come to realize he's tired of coming to jail. I got a record. It's embarrassing. I come to jail. They tell me, oh, you've been here uh, 17 times, you know? Like, yeah. I, I spent like like past two years of my life in, in county jail. I'm just tired. Having just heard that his 30-day sentence has been reduced to 15, inmate Johns is nervous about his release, knowing that he has an outstanding warrant for $10,000. I got a, a, a warrant, so I was supposed to get out on uh, the 4th of July, right, this holiday. I've just been in my cell, my, my, my dorm, I mean, my bunk, thinking about my warrant. I don't know if they're going to let me go or not, so I'm kind of paranoid. I'm hoping that I could just kind of like squeeze through this here, you know, without the, the probation officer saying that, and, you know. If they see that, they, 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 could, they could really keep me here for a long time. Next on Lockup, the L.A. County Jail uses star power to reach out to violent inmates. Often, when inmates leave L.A. County Jail, they encounter problems getting a job due to lack of occupational skills. Without a job, most inmates quickly fall back into a life of crime, which is why the vocational programs available at L.A. County Jail are always filled with inmates. The inmates that work in the vocational print shop consider this to be more a job and not actually working at jail. Regardless of their crime, all inmates are offered the chance to work while in jail. We don't assign them to work with anyone. We don't assign them what machines they're going to be on. We let them make all their decisions. Uh, they've made decisions for their life. This is part of their life, and they, they have to pick up the tools that we offer them. And if they can improve themselves, then it's, again, a decision that they made. Getting a job outside of jail is only half the battle against recidivism which is why new programs for inmates are encouraged at L.A. County. Elected Sheriff Lee Baca and NFL Hall of Famer Jim Brown have started an intensive self-improvement training course for inmates inside the L.A. County Jail. The course was originally designed to help reduce the racially motivated violence that was occurring daily within the walls of the jail. We needed to take that environment and make it a productive one where people can actually reflect on their problems, get involved in our programs, and leave this jail better than they were when they came in. The program is called AmeriCan, and it is a 60-hour program that takes 42 days to complete. AmeriCan accepts any inmate regardless of their arrest charge and past criminal history. It's important because it teaches an individual to take control of their own lives. It gives them life skills, fundamentals, which allows them to understand how to succeed. A lot of people don't receive those from their parents. Well, what you need is conscientious effort that's placed on education, education of all kinds, an investment in that, a real investment in it. You're going to always need strong, fair, just law enforcement. So what I'm saying to you is you need a balance. You must put it into the education, but you also must deal with the incarceration properly. That's a fair way of putting it. The rate of racially based disturbances like this one, captured on surveillance video, used to be about one per month. But jail officials claim that the AmeriCan program has drastically reduced the number of incidents throughout the jail. There's a certain rule that blacks stay with blacks, Hispanics stay with Hispanics, the whites stay with whites, and you can't intermingle. I mean, you can high and buy, but there's a certain tension that you got to experience. It's like, you know, any given moment, you can get into a fight all out brawl. Inmates like Jeffrey Glaze say the program helps break down the racial barriers that lead to violence. Now I got some hope, and that's real. You know, I don't want to sound cheesy or nothing, but this program really turned my whole thinking around. 
and I have to help myself. It ain't all about what they can do for me. I mean, they cram it down you. It's uh, 15 chapters. And they make sure you know it. They do a real good job. <clears throat> and it's taught by fellow prisoners that m most of them have been locked up or have came from the streets or ex-game members or what have you. Having spent 17 years of his life behind bars, 32-year-old inmate Michael Graham is looking forward to his job as a scaffolding worker. I wrote and got a real good job from here and uh, got a reply, yes, they're willing to hire me and uh, things are looking pretty good. Upon successful completion of the course, inmates are given a graduation ceremony. For this year's graduation, they were treated with the appearance of a special guest speaker. Somebody says, what motivates you? I said, injustice. I wake up every day motivated because every day I wake up, there's a new thing to deal with in the way injustice goes down. Injustice is everywhere. So I got a job everywhere I go. Singer, actor, and activist Harry Belafonte travels to the most violent places in the world. His goal is to speak to people who are the creators of and the resistors to the violence. With his inspirational words, Belafonte gives each inmate a personal challenge. Your failure is my failure. Your success is my success. Like somewhere where you go, you carry the responsibility and the destiny of my children and my children's children and their friends and their community. And they can either look at you as someone in a group to be shunned or they can look at you as an example of how to take the worst cards dealt in life and turn the deck around and make it your game and play a winning hand every time out. Get the community to focus on something it can have faith in and for that institution to then move to the outside world and says you must look in, in a very different way and how the prison population is being treated, I think it's a great opportunity. Next on Lockup, inmates in the L.A. County Jail get back their freedom. I hope to reacclimate myself into society and become a positive role model for somebody somewhere or at least be able to stand up like I'm doing right now, except without county blues on, and tell them you don't want to go there because they're going to treat you like you're not human. Back to the neighborhood and kick it. Try to find a job to take care of my wife. Smoke me a cigarette and buy a Pepsi. I feel that I would be available to come back and try to help others with, with the same problem that I have because I've tried to help my fellow inmates in here on some of the problems that they have. We're gonna have some fun. <laughs> um, I don't know, take a shower, go to Denny's. If my wife is here me, I would like to go out and um, probably help kids and um, probably uh, get a good job. Just cut the alcohol, the beers and all that stuff, then I'll be all right. I wanna change. That's the difference now. It's got to be something more. Usually I accepted the fact that, well, this was just it. You know, I want to change now. I don't know how I'm going to do that, but I just know I want to change. See my kids. Pick up my new little girl. Well, this time I'm trying to program for one. I never get out and try to program, you know. And also I'm trying God in my life, which I haven't tried God in my life. Well, hopefully I won't need to seek any help. I think if law enforcement would leave me alone, I'd be just fine. Go see my kids. Call my dad and go to Bullhead. Start over. I go back out there. I try to go back to work. I was working for uh, LAX, shipping and receiving. I got a pretty good job. It was a break for me. First thing I'm going to do is make a phone call and go find my husband. Uh, if I get another felony, I get life. Yeah, increased strike counter. So, you know, 
I just don't want to come back, you know. I can't predict my own future, you know, but I just know maybe I might stay out for a while. I might come back. Before, it's, uh, this, this place had a sign saying, welcome back. The L.A. County Jail releases 800 inmates a day on weekdays and 250 per day on weekends. They're housed in different areas throughout the county. We'll send a pass for them. If they're out at Valencia, the buses will bring them in, usually around the night, around midnight to 3 o'clock, because people that get um, 1201 releases, or what we call them, they're scheduled to be released on the next business day, which is, you know, is midnight. Probably about midnight, 1 o'clock, close to 2, 1 30. Do you know what date it is? Yeah, it's the 4th, 4th of July. Independence Day. Yep. Yep. Remember the 4th of July. <laughs> Before any inmate can be released from jail, they are fingerprinted one more time to verify identification and check to see if they have any outstanding warrants. They'll get their property, and if they have any property here or any money, and then once that's done, then they can leave. For some inmates, leaving L.A. County Jail and dealing with the outside world is a lot more frightening than being locked up. The only people like, um, will be like homeless people who, you know, enjoy having the free meal, the bed, and they don't want to go yet. And they'll start screaming at the site. We've had inmates put feces on the doors, you know, scream, throw off all their clothing to make it look like they're not ready to leave. But for the most part, it's all an act. And they'll still get released. Because the streets of L.A. offer no support for inmates trying to get back on their feet, the Sheriff's Department created a community transition unit to help former inmates with the basic necessities. Well, part of the process is to begin changing a system that was primarily focused on incarcerating people. And although we've, for decades, had thousands of inmates involved in educational vocational programs, what we were not doing was linking them with community resources. Lieutenant Mike Parker supervises the community transition unit, which assists inmates in getting jobs and finding a place to live after jail. In the first few minutes when somebody gets out of jail, I hear from inmates, social workers, you name, homeless shelter people, you name it. The first few minutes when they leave the jail is the most pivotal. We are here to try to assist you um, at some housing, whatever you need, transportation, uh, California ID, Job developer, there are there any special needs right now? Yes. What, like what? I need housing and I need employment. Okay then. For Curtis Calloway, the community transition program couldn't have come at a better time. Because I need help. That's basically, basically it. No matter how I may speak or sound, I need help. That's what it is, you know. Because I'm not a bad guy, you know. You know, I'm a good guy. But it's just, it is, simple fact. One time I used drugs at one time, right? And then I had a straight stress, and I didn't know which way to turn. Cut the wristband off. Uh, you cut it off? Freedom. No, I don't want to come back, but, you know, how L.A., um, county is, um, you never know what might happen at any given moment, and you could get caught up in any situation out here that caused you to actually do some more time in here, whether it's a traffic ticket, small misdemeanor, or, or get confused with someone else out here, because sometimes people can walk like you and look like you from a distance, and then you get caught up in that same situation. Um, going on. It's midnight on the 4th of July, and former inmate Daniel Johns is hopeful about his future after spending 15 days of his life inside L.A. County Jail. My property, man. Wonderful, man. I, I got a bunch of responsibilities to go take care of. You know? Man, I, I, I'm just never coming back to this place anymore, you know? When I, when I got, man, I, you know? I'm gonna do what I gotta do and get, get going, get my life, you know, back on my feet take care of my responsibilities and, and don't break the law. With only the clothes on his back and a couple of bus tokens in his pocket, Daniel Johns walks out of jail, once again a free man. 